Siblings Justin and Marissa are out sledding across the frozen tundra of Antarctica when they come across the mythical blue sea lion, the very creature their father had been looking for. It's out on a frozen lake, and when the two set out to cross it, the ice breaks up and they fall into the water. But what happens next? The kids don't know. Their dad is tired and wants to go to bed. He'll continue the story tomorrow. Yeah, there's a lot of that in this book. Justin and Marissa's father is a collector of stories. And he's taken the kids out to the country of Brovaria, searching for the lost legend, which is very old and hidden inside a silver chest, unseen for 500 years. Well, that night, the pair discover a dog outside of their tent with a tag on it that says, I know why you're here. Follow Silver Dog. Silver Dog? Silver Chest? This can't be a coincidence. So the kids follow the dog to a house deep in the woods where a Viking lady lives named Ivana. She of course knows where the chest is, but first the pair have to pass a test, with the stipulation being that they need to stay alive doing so. It never quite gets to that point as everything turns out to be an illusion. At one point they're attacked by an army of mice, but they find they're mechanized. And when Justin runs smack into a tree, he knocks it over as it's only fake. And when they make it back to Ivana's place, they find she's a fake too with a giant wind-up key sticking out of her back. What's all this for? To test if they can differentiate between what's real and what's not. This makes no sense until the ending. They're told where to find the chest, which has been safeguarded by a group of nomads that roam the forest. These nomads are only too willing to give the chest to Justin and Marissa, who by this point are joined by their father, eager to become famous. They open up the chest and... There's another message. Whomever owns the lost legend will be lost forever. Whoops. Maybe their dad should have taken Ivana's test as well. I actually kind of like this one. I know it gets a lot of hate, but the underlying message to understand the difference between reality and fiction is actually pretty smart. Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns. This is another book that has sentimental value for me. Even though it has an ending that's about as bizarre as a girl who cried monster, I was taken with the idea of these jack-o'-lantern costumes to the point where I made one for myself one year for Halloween. Hey, who's that pumpkin? So what's the deal with the pumpkin heads? Well, the main character Drew and her friends Walker, Shane, and Shauna are out for revenge against a pair of stuck-up kids named Tabby and Lee. Two Halloweens ago, Tabby and Lee had invited all the kids over for a party, where they staged a break-in and had the kids do push-ups. Tabby and Lee were laughing their asses off seeing their classmates made fools of. Yeah, some joke. It's like if I invited somebody over and held a knife to their throat and said if they don't repeat the alphabet backwards within 30 seconds they're going to get cut. Then I burst out laughing and say, you should have seen the look on your face, bro. You totally believed me. Obviously a little extreme, but you get the point. So this Halloween, Drew and friends cook up a plot so good, it's out of this world. Drew and Walker get Tabby and Lee to trick or treat with them but are worried that Shane and Shauna haven't shown up. After a while, they're approached by a couple of maniacs wearing pumpkin heads, who say they know of a good neighborhood to get candy. They lead the kids through the woods to a neighborhood that's fully decked out in Halloween decorations. The kids quickly fill up on candy and want to go home, but the pumpkins won't let them, saying there are still more houses to go to. Tired of the prank, Tabby and Lee pull the pumpkins off the kids' shoulders, only to find there are no heads underneath. In full panic mode, the kids have no choice but to keep trick-or-treating. When their bags fill up with candy, the pumpkins tell the kids to eat what they have so they can continue on. They'll be doing this for eternity, after all. Or will they? When Lee and Tabby refuse to walk any further, the pumpkins float up into the sky and call out to the pumpkin heads that live in the neighborhood. The front door of every house opens up, revealing more of the creatures, and they surround the kids, brandishing four empty pumpkin heads. Who are they for? The kids, of course! These are their new heads, and the jack-o'-lanterns slam the pumpkins over the heads of Tabby and Lee, who promptly run down the street screaming for their lives. Drew and Walker laugh at them, looking back at the two pumpkin kids, who reveal themselves to be Shane and Shauna. And this next part really has to be seen to be believed. So Drew says, We did it, we did it, we really scared them, we finally scared them. That was so much fun, Walker exclaimed, and so easy. Drew stepped up to Shane and Shauna and hugged them both. Of course, it helps to have two aliens from another planet as friends. What in the hell? Like the girl who cried monster, I was stunned over this insane twist. Aliens? The kids were aliens the whole time? Then why did Drew and Walker act so scared in private, whispering to each other that they had no idea what was going on? What was the point of that? If they knew what was going on, why didn't they smile or wink at each other? Because deus ex machina, that's why. I love this series.